Incredibly interesting. And I thought there was lots of good stuff in there. So I think, Sam? Um, I thought it was quite interesting that Nancy is a construct of like her own environment. Yeah. And that um, she becomes sort of, her vices yeah. come from her environment and how she's, been, like, how she's grown up. But Oliver still retained that angelic, sort of saint like thing that yeah. he doesn't seem to be affected by the environment as, by his environment as much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's a really important issue in this novel. Um, what was that phrase you used, Nishan, about Nancy being a construct of her circumstances? Yeah, and as Sam was saying, I mean, that, that seems to be very important in this novel for a lot of the characters, but not for Oliver, because Oliver seems to sort of breeze through this criminal milieu with, with no problem. He sort of preserves his inherent saintliness. What's going on there, do you think? Why is that the case? I don't know, I think there's an interesting point that you raised about Oliver being foreshadowing himself for this middle class existence in the future. The whole thing that you kind of know where he's going, and he, not that he knows, but it's kind of like he's in on it as well. Um, doesn't sort of give in, even though consequences could potentially be very unforgiving. Like, yeah. you know, he refuses to do things for all these criminal gangs and stuff. And as a small child, it's almost unbelievable. But um, I don't know how, obviously, it's. He is that, that, that flat sort of, um, I wrote down, um, that is a static character, he's a, a, a social character, I guess. Yeah. And it's Dickens trying to say maybe that you could be mid, like, middle class, even though you're not born middle class, you know, you're destined to be this gentleman of great repute. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's, defi that's definitely the case, isn't it? Because throughout the whole novel, people, you know, characters are saying, oh, there's something different about Oliver, and he's not like these other criminals. And then at the end, it's like, it's because he's middle class, really. And it all, it's all sort of resolved, and, and, you know, he's sort of, and that seems to be inherent in his birth, doesn't it? And it's sort of, I mean, in a way, it, it, it's, it's a debate that we still have in some senses now. It's sort of a nature-nurture thing. It's a question of whether your character, your identity, is determined by your environment, by uh, the things you're exposed to and the things you are, you are forced to do by circumstances. And that seems to be the case with Nancy. Um, or whether your identity is inherent in you somehow. And for Dickens, it seems to be, for, with Oliver, the idea that is that uh, you know, his, his character is sort of inherent in his class, in the fact that he was born to this sort of respectable middle class family. Um, and despite the trials and privations he's been through, that identity is preserved, uh, despite what happens to him. I mean, are those two sort of views of identity resolved in the novel, do you think? Does he, Dickens find a way of squaring them, or are they two separate uh, ideas that sort of remain in conflict? Right. This guy, like, he's barely more than a pair of doe eyes and he gets the jolly life at the end. So I think it's kind of, I don't think he sorts it out. Really. I think, I kind of, I know obviously you know Oliver doesn't die, but I kind of wanted him to die. I'm like, oh, would that be the best way? But I always wanted to die. But would it be the best way for Dickens to get his point across if he's going, oh look, um, someone who had the possibility of having this like bright future but look, he didn't because he died. But instead he's gone, actually, without any outside... Well, he has got outside help from, like, the, like, the posh people, but that's only because he's got links. Like, it, it's got nothing to do with the government stepping in, and so, like, shouldn't he have gone, actually, you're not doing anything about this or this kid's going to die, or go into a life of crime. But instead he kind of goes, actually... It's almost like he's, he's trying to say it's bad, but in a way he says that... It, it's okay. I think he's trying to say, I think by leaving Oliver to his, all, his lovely happy ending, that eventually there will be some form of equality. Eventually there's an inevitability about it would, all this horribleness will come to an end and everybody can come back. The way I like to see it. <laughs> okay, okay. Because there, there is a bit of tragedy in the ending of the novel as well, isn't there? With, you know, poor Dick. Who, who does die. And Dickens is quite fond, fond of killing children. You know? He does this quite a lot in a lot of his novels. And so there's that element of tragedy with this sort of small character, Oliver's friend Dick, who, who has to die uh, to remind everyone of the cruelty of the system. But it's also... 
as Vicky was saying, he offers a happy ending as well. He offers that resolution, which is sort of, you know, um, uh, a sort of a narrative pleasure, you know, for the reader. It's all nicely resolved for Oliver, and we can, we can revel in a happy ending. I think like, the book seems to operate on this whole moral law. Like, yeah, there's some actual, you know, judicial system, but they just bypass that. Mr. Brownlow comes in and says, oh, no, I'll take you, and I'll look after him. I don't want him. You know, yeah. All that. Yeah. And um, they even dish out their own. You know, they go and kidnap psychs and stuff. Yeah. Because there's the whole middle class. Um, sorry, monks. Yeah. yeah. But because there's the whole middle class, they're doing it for the great good. And, you know, and then, and that same moral law, because Oliver hasn't put a foot wrong the whole book. You know, he's destined to have this outcome, rather than I don't know. Like, it doesn't really work for Dick because he hasn't done anything wrong. Mm. But, like, yeah. Dick's like the sacrifice. Guys, like, you know, they all end up dead or. Australia, so it's kind of <laughs> 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 much, much the same thing. So, Katie Jane. The problem with the fact that Oliver's like kind of this like angelic fairy at the top, because in a way, by saying, oh, well, he was always middle class, uh -huh. and then the others, because they're not middle class and they have done wrong things, like to me, it's making it look like, well, by being a lower class, it makes him a bad person. Mm -hmm. Whereas because he was always middle class, he wasn't ever going to step out of line. So, I actually have a little bit of a problem with it. Um, like a social standing, if you're going to try and make a comment, it kind of actually still highlights them as being morally wrong for being. Mm. Uh, yeah. I well, find um, all of the sort of middle class attributes to be kind of more in fitting of uh, Dickens' understanding his own audience. Okay. Because, um, like, the great greater proportion of that time of people, great re large readers, were the middle to upper class, like, audience. Mm -hmm. um, by having a character who is kind of bland, and but speaks automatically from the very beginning in a sort of very well received English. Mm -hmm. It's allowing his audience, who are upper to middle class, to inject themselves into him, because at that point, having a character who speaks in sort of proper Cockney style, or actually <laughs> the speech of the lower class at that time, the prejudices may be inflected upon that character, which would actually distance the character from the audience. Yeah. Because the larger audience of that time were middle class and did speak, quote unquote, properly. And so to enable um, him to be actually the sort of bland, angelic figure, mm -hmm. they could associate themselves with him and go I into this low class world and see kind of the depths of which this, the, kind of like the government have failed in you know, because they're seeing it from their own perspective. Mm. And then by allowing it to continue on that trait to see a much more hopeful ending, that actually instills some pos possible act activism in the audience rather than actually if it's just depressing, people just go <clears throat> and just close the book and cry. Whereas um, if it actually has some ending, like, there is potential for these people. Look at all the people who along the way throughout the story lose this hope and collapse. But this one person who is you in the book and you're reading with somehow survives to the end. Okay, okay. Yeah, I quite like that idea that Oliver could be sort of a proxy for the reader almost. And that he's sort of this vessel that you can just sort of inhabit almost as you journey through this novel. So. Um, I agree with this idea that... Um you were saying about the lower classes sort of being, oh, you're lower class and therefore you're never going to get out of it, you're just going to die. Mm. Um, although I do think he tries to sort of balance this out through monks as a character. Mm -hmm. But yeah. again, you okay. could say that because he sort of gets himself involved with the lower strata, like, he, he's just, he's as bad as them almost. Well, because Monks is bad from the beginning, isn't he? There's something inherently wrong with his character, and his father realises this. There's some sort of moral problem with him. Um, but that's also something like the... the is it epilepsy he has, or some sort of... Well, presumably, some yeah. Sort of some yeah. disease yeah. that he has. Yeah. It seems to sort of... I don't know, I think it was... If you do that now, like, if you've written that down now in a novel, you'd probably go, oh, for him, for him. Like, get really sympathy for him, but... In this book, it just seems like it just adds to his evil nature. Like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. This, this is the reason he's diseased, and therefore he's corrupt. Absolutely. And evil. It is a sign of his, you know, of his moral failing in some way, isn't it? Absolutely, I think that's definitely the case. Mercedes. Um, going back to the point about it appearing like Dickens is sort of punishing the lower classes and rewarding the upper middle class, um, I don't think it's anything to do with social hierarchy. I think it's more about how hard you work. I think it's more okay. kind of like in the whole Victorian period, it was like, let's praise the people who work hard and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oliver has to kind of struggle through the workhouse and find his way as a small child whereas Nancy for example kind of turns to a life of crime and I think that's why she's ultimately punished rather than Oliver not because she's lower class but because he's like worked 
well, he hasn't worked hard, but because he had to be in the workhouse and kind of struggle, like, I think that's more why he's rewarded. But, but yeah, yeah I, th well, I, think that's, I, think that's, I think that's true uh, to an extent. Um, and also, the way that Nancy is punished in the novel is slightly different from the way a character like Monks is punished yeah. in the novel. So Nancy, you're not meant to see Nancy's fate as a just... Um, the just result of her actions. It's, it's a tragedy, isn't it? We're meant to, I think we as readers are meant to feel for her. And Dickens, you know, at the moments like this, pours on the sentiment and pours on the melodrama to try and encourage the reader uh, to uh, see Nancy as a sort of a tragic figure, I think, on some level. So I don't think, I think, I think the point Lawrence made about there being this sort of moral law which sort of supersedes the, the law of the land and, you know, it's sort of is based on individual morality, I think is a very important idea for Dickens. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's not quite as simple as saying that these sort of the middle classes are moral and the lower classes are immoral. Uh, there are sort of characters on both sides, I think. Sam, were you going to...? Um, I was just going to say that there appears to be sort of two camps. You've got the good and the evil characters, yeah. Yeah. and then Nancy sort of bridges that gap because she's not really evil, but she's not completely good. Mm. Oh, the bridge Beth is talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this was Nancy yeah. as a bridge. Okay. I this picture of some dead pros under a bridge. <laughs> 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 and, um, and right, okay. Was right. it the, the bridge to the afterlife or something? Yeah, as well? and the bridge from life to death. Bridge is important. Okay. And okay. how she makes them on the bridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Has anybody else got any other thoughts about this issue? Because the other thing I wanted to pick up on from the presentation was this idea that you had, Vicky, of, of Oliver being um, sort, of a, a sort of an agent for... What was the phrase? An agent for social... Social reform. Social reform, yeah. Rather than a sort of a fully realised, uh, psychologically nuanced character or individual. He's there with specific purpose. That's why he's not developed in the world. He's just, just plopped in the book. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really important question for this novel. And it, it, it sort of leads on to the, the two quotations that I, I put on the handout that I gave you last week. Um, and, and the first one was this idea about, you know, this, this quote from E.M. Forster, the 20th century novelist, this idea about Dickens um, writing flat characters. Uh, and um, you know, Forster says that when Dickens tries to write rounded characters, he creates sort of bubbles rather than solids. And so Forster has this view. Uh, it's quite, sort of quite a famous criticism of Dickens that even when Dickens tries to present sort of psychologically nuanced and fully realised characters, they're somehow uh, unbelievable or insubstantial. Um, and I suppose there are two questions about this. Uh, the first is whether we agree with Forster. Uh, and it seems from what you've been saying that you, you perhaps do, that Dickens doesn't create rounded characters. Uh, the second question is that uh, it seems clear to me that Forster's making a value judgment. He's saying that uh, you know, round characters are better than flat characters, and Dickens can't do round characters. And so uh, do we agree with that? You know, is it a problem? Is it a failing or a weakness in Dickens' writing that these characters aren't sort of, you know, developing and psychologically complex, necessarily. It would have <coughs> definitely complicated things had people been able to reform. Had Zero Fagin got up and gone, God, oh, I'm so sorry, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> shouldn't be making you steal handkerchiefs. Or <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. it completely destroys that whole, like, who's good, who's bad, who does, who does Oliver see as, you know, as a, as a role model, or, you know, who does he take his... Uh, Inspiration from, I guess, like his Mr. Brown that is clearly presented as this really. He's a complete stranger to Oliver, mm -hmm. as we forget, like all the people are, and he just, much like Fagin, just picks him up off the street. Mm -hmm. But for some yeah. reason, you know, he's, he's accepted as being, oh, you know, he'll look after me, sort of thing. Yeah, um, that's a really good point. If he had been rounded, if he'd have been like, Mr. Brown is nice, but you know, if you get on his nerves, he'll give you a beating or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> it does complicate things. Can't imagine more, it. Think, maybe. Too much realism. Yeah. It could ruin the whole political and social agenda of it, I think. So is that the point then? The, well, the, the novel is more about a political agenda? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I think so, anyway. Okay. I think if you were going to make it like psychological, you could start seeing how every character felt kind of thing. A, because there is a lot of characters, it would just be confusing. Yeah. I think everyone would be looking at page. And then also, I think that like, if you were to start having like, the feelings, then the kind of like 
really clear cut, this is good, this is evil, and then Nancy Bridging, like, if you start to get like, their emotional thought on how they feel for everything that they do, then you lose kind of the actual difference, like the clear cut, like this is the apparently mm. good person, this is like the bad person. Mm. I think it would just confuse it so to the extent that you'd no longer know what you're aiming for. Like it would I think it would lose any commentary on like hierarchy. It would then just be like, and it's this and it's this. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's an important point uh, that you make that there are a lot of characters in the novel as well. That it is, um, so maybe that relates to this idea that it's more, the novel's more about sort of a social or political uh, idea or focus rather than a psychological one. It's more about giving a sort of portrait of a society or certain sections of a society. Does that make sense? Does that sound like something that you would agree with? And so, is this flatness therefore not a problem? Is it just that Dickens is trying to do something different? He's not trying to create round characters. Mm. I don't think it's a problem. Okay. <laughs> but like, because so, if this is meant to come under like, this is meant to be a Bildungs remark, right? Well, like, that's, a, that's, a debate, like, that's a debatable question. But like, question. how are we meant to follow this character from like, childhood through to adulthood and he's growing? And that's the whole point of kind of that term. And he's not, he's not doing any of that, so I can't well, like, yeah. You can't really it either. Then I would say that you can't categorise it as that because I, other than the fact that he's growing by day and through time, <laughs> slightly think, literal yeah, interpretation of the term like buildings, right? He, he is. It's not like when we look at Gaskell and stuff like North and South and things. Then you see that that's obviously yeah. a growth, and um, even in hard times with, with Dickens, you see certain characters and then they do grow. But here, um, they'll have like a week bit and then they'll grow some more. But Oliver doesn't do anything. Mm. So he can't, I don't think he can really be the hero of the book. I think without Nancy, this would kind of be not worthless, but worth a lot less. Mm. And, um, and that's why, it, kind of in the film and everything, like I know they're not good versions, but they kind of pick up on these characters who are more interesting than Oliver. Oliver's kind of like there looking, oh, look, can't I cute? And, um, and Nancy's there, and everyone remembers Nancy, and everyone remembers Dodger, mm. and it's kind of like, and Fagin, and Sykes, like, the good boy is kind of like, he's much lesser, even though he's the name of the book. Mm. Mm. He, he tends to be either asleep a lot, or <laughs> 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 he tends to be taken away from the main plot, actually yeah. quite yeah. a lot. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. At that point, just kind of thinking, yeah, he's not actually that, that important in there. No, no, and he becomes... Sorry. Sorry, I know I was just saying on, because you were talking about, oh, it's a buildings run, mm. and I was thinking about, or well, originally when it was released as a format, it was sort of serial, wasn't it? It was episodical. Yes. Each chapter yeah. was in a magazine, yeah. and it was called The Parish Boys Progress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they take away from the fact that Oliver's not even the main character, really. Mm. He's just a parish boy, but through him you get to see all this, you know, all the seedy underworld and all the greatness of, you know... That, that's what I was about to say, like he's a device yep. to meet yep. these other characters yep. and he needs to be impartial, otherwise you wouldn't get like a true account. If he, if he had this other side to him, if he was psychological and there was depth to him, there could be like different perceptions of the others and I think mm. he needs to be an impartial mm. boy in order to be able to see the world that he's exploring. Mm. I think that's a really good point. I think this idea of seeing Oliver as a device, is a, as a plot device almost, is a very useful way of approaching this novel. Uh, he's sort of almost, he's like this empty centre, almost, around which all these more sort of interesting characters, and also all this social commentary can revolve. You know, he gives some sort of coherence or cohesion uh, to the book. Um, but, as you say, perhaps the interest in the book isn't really in him. Um. I think this passivity means that sometimes you can sort of just view him as an object. Okay. Like you could almost change it and not call the book Oliver Twist. You could call it Oliver a teapot. <laughs> and like, you know, someone loses the teapot and then it gets taken, <laughs> <laughs> it's taken into the theme right. and, then, and then the middle classes take it back and then they Start steal it back again. And they glue it together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's so passive, he's just like an object. Yeah. You just yeah. pass him around yeah. and he just... You know, like Vicky said, he just sleeps and gets ill. Mm. And, then, like, <laughs> and cries a bit. He cries a bit as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's strange, like, he's, the fact that, you know, he's not got his parents, he's not got anyone in the world, and he's still just sort of like, oh, well, we'll do sort of this one, I guess. That the only point that he ever, <laughs> like, you ever see any, any emotion out of him to do with, like, his being alone in the world and not having parents and things is when um, 
he gets attacked, well, he gets provoked when Noah Clayhorn and he starts. Yeah. That's really interesting. That is, that is interesting, that's yes. Actually, that's the thing that's probably the only point in the novel you actually see any emotion from them. Yeah. And certainly it seems to be the only point where he does anything sort of active, where he initiates something, you know, he sort of takes it on, he's, he makes his own decision uh, to leave Mr. Salbury's and to go to London and to attack Noah and all that stuff. And so there is a degree of agency in Oliver, but it's a very small degree. It's almost like Dickens tried and then went, well, this isn't going to work. So I think we can fairly well agree that with Oliver, there is definitely a sense that he doesn't develop as a character. And as Giselle was saying, this, you know, uh, you know, if this is a buildings Roman, if this is a novel of development, it's not Oliver's development. You know, but so um, you know, we'll have to leave that aside. But in, in terms of the other characters in the novel, uh, to go back to Forster's quotation where he calls them flat, or he calls Dickens' characters flat in general, that doesn't seem to me like a very fair or accurate description of Dickens' characters. And what do you think? I think, like... When you look at Nancy, like, okay, you don't have like this psychological thing throughout it, but actually, like, as a dynamic within it, like the different characters and the actual action, like what happens to mm -hmm. her, how you can say that's flat and boring, I'm not, but like, I can't agree. Like, there's mm. no way you can say that she's like everything that she does is boring. Mm. Mm. And similarly, like with Fagan and things, I don't, like, I find the whole idea about having like a group of kids together and like going, okay, just go and steal some things, like that's not boring, that's quite like, mm. well, um, quite old, really. But um, I can see like, if you're going to talk about it like psychologically, then yeah, I wouldn't say it's like particularly exciting, but also I think if you, were, if you think about it in its original form as an episode, if you were going to be like, if it was psychological, would it work? Because you'd be waiting out in between and stuff. I think, I don't know, I don't see how that would work at all. Mm. Okay. I think they're not necessarily 2D. I mean, they are developed. Like Fagin, yeah, he's a bad bloke, but he still sort of, you know, semi looks after Oliver, yeah. you know, treats him, you know, <coughs> fairly acceptably. And stuff like, um, I was just thinking about Mr. Bumble. Mm. Is yeah. Like a horrible, hard line, uh, like parochial. Is he called Beetle. Beetle, yeah. yeah. And then he sort of loses it all for his because he falls in love with um that woman. Mrs. Corney. At the workhouse, yeah. yeah. And then yeah. you know, he immediately resent, you know, and then he has to go work there and it's sort of this stuff happens all the time. It's very like Victorian East Enders stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't think they're flat in that sense. Like, you know, things happen to them, right? Like with psychs um sorry, monks having some sort of, you know, condition. Uh -huh. like just yeah. the very inclusion of that means that he's thought about you know, more of their different uh, attributes or whatever. Mm, yeah, Lewis. I think the way it's narrated as well could add to the flatness of the characters because uh, you don't ever really see like the middle class characters with flaws. But there is a point where mm. they kidnap monks, but you don't see it. It sort of just happens and you come into it with him coming up with the bag over his head or whatever. Mm. And like, mm. uh, It's quite interesting that they don't show that because Obviously, you're going to get a bad opinion of the middle class for stooping down to the lower class level by kidnapping him. But then again, all we have to do is take Monks' word, but why should we? Because he's lower class than the middle class who have kidnapped him. Well, Monks isn't lower class, is he? Well, I mean, like, he's part of the... Uh, but he's bad. Yeah, he's part yeah. of the bad groups. That's, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Poor choice of words, but yeah. Yeah. No, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I think that's a fair point, yeah. Uh, I mean, characters like Mr. Brownlow and Rose and Mrs. Maley do seem perfect. They seem just as saint-like as Oliver. Um, but very boring, exactly. And I suppose, so boring. Yeah, and I suppose that's what I guess that's what I was getting at when I was when I was wondering about the use of the word flat because it seems the characters like the Dodger and Fagin, flat just seems to be the, the, the worst word to describe them. You know, you might not get inside their minds, but if anything, they're over the top. You know, they are over, they're hyper exaggerated uh, rather than being flat, and which sort of suggests you know dull and uninteresting to me. Psychological depth doesn't have to be explored for you to notice there. Okay. Because, like, in Fagin, you know, he's, he's got into the position he is. Please, something's had to happen for that to happen. Mm -hmm. You don't mm -hmm. just suddenly go, pop, I know, I'm going to you know, pick pockets. That's mm -hmm. what I'm doing today. Um, and then he says things like um, he loves the judicial system because of the irony of it that um, so many things, so many on it, on, honest, honesties don't get said. Mm. Because, you know, basically, you're, you're considered a criminal, you're killed, boom, that you can't give anything else. So, one, Fagin gets away with a lot, because a lot of people who have something against him get killed. And then he also comments on just the irony of it, and the fact that the judicial system's habit of killing people 
is in fact not helping the situation at all. And yeah. Comments on this yeah. and delights in it. But mm -hmm. he delights in it is in itself a really interesting character trait. Mm -hmm. But we're never told why, and I don't think we need to because, as Lawrence said, that would bog down like the political agenda of the book, mm -hmm. and you just kind of have to wade through. You know, if you want character development, or if you want over the top, sultry sort of shifts from one thing, go to sense of sensibility. But if you want an actual agenda, then go to Dickens. Mm. for this aspect. It's kind of the, the slot he put himself into because it was at the very beginning of the gender-filled Victorian narratives. And like, things like Lewis commented on, I thought that was deliberate of Dickens. Okay. By having monks be captured and it just be kind of gone, blah, 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 and like, like it's not really a bad issue. Mm. Like, mm. oh, this is a middle of the class. I, was like, I thought that's, that's so the audience would then kind of realise that the same thing is happening in the middle class, but it's actually in a narrative, in a social reform, sort of reform sense, being completely accepted. I mean, not actually considered this horrible, horrible thing that it was. So you think, on some level, Dickens is sort of critiquing the middle classes as well as the as the, sort of, as the social that, setup more generally. Acceptance, but their, their acceptance of the way poor people were treated. Mm. I thought he was having a bit of a bitch slap. Okay. <laughs> All right. Does anybody agree with or disagree with that? Yeah, it's hard to know what Dickens thinks of his own class. Well, exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, I mean, obviously, he doesn't have a lot. Of love for some people but he's very very aware that that's his audience and especially if we uh, if we do agree that this is for some sort of political agenda, mm. social agenda mm. they're the people that will have some sort of market difference if they read this like mm. it won't be fair enough maybe he would be very happy if people in the workhouses were sitting there reading Oliver Twist <laughs> totally <happy. laughs> but, um, <laughs> I don't think they had much time for reading <laughs> um. but then like you know that's a bit more like reading sort of what you do anyway <laughs> I don't know if you get what I mean. Like yeah. The people. That Why would you read Oliver Twist if you're in a workhouse? Yeah, to yeah. be careful. He might have actually not liked the middle class at all. Well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. He might have thought, God, yeah. yeah. But, um, but he has to be has to be aware of the, the social sort of situation. Yeah. If he wants to make a change, if he wants to write a book that's actually, you know, got some sort of weight behind it. And I, and I think certainly that happy ending, that need to resolve this very, very complicated and at times ridiculously coincidental plot, the need to resolve that neatly at the end, which he does very, very sort of uh, efficiently, I think is sort of is, is, would be driven by market forces as well, the need to give people a satisfying ending and to, and to sort of complete the novel as a sort of an organic whole. Um, I think we can see exactly what Dickens thinks, to be honest, because you know, he's obviously quite happy to be a middle-class person because he's been in the workhouses. He's probably very grateful that he had the inheritance um, that his family did at the time. Mm, mm -hmm. um, but he's still absolutely fascinated by the lower classes. Mm. Perhaps because you know that's where he could have ended up if there was no money. Mm. So he's obviously grateful, which I think is probably why you get these sort of la di da oh, I'm, I'm so perfect, sort of middle-class characters. But these sort of really interesting, <coughs> poorer characters in the book. Mm. I think you can see like Dickens' conflict, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, I, you can't ignore that autobiographical element in this novel of, for, from Dickens, certainly, as, as Vicky was saying. Lewis? He could be satirising the banality of the middle classes, though. Okay. Uh, he's always uh, referencing Mr. Bumbler as a great man. And obviously, we, yeah, <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, uh, yeah. I mean, there's beyond doubt that he is satirising people like Bumble. I mean, because Bumble for him is sort of is is one of the one of the sort of one of the tools, one of the parts of this oppressive, corrupt, uh, unfair, unjust system, isn't it? This sort of political system that that he is attacking in this novel. He's my favourite character. <laughs> well, he's certainly entertaining. <laughs> He gets married to the, to the woman and then she overhears him saying something that she just doesn't want to hear and she's like, right, I'm going to make his life hell. Yeah. And, oh, it's brilliant. What is a beetle? It's sort of a low-level uh, local official, essentially a local parish official. So he's sort of a general sort of, you know, council, parish council dog's body, essentially, you know, but he sort of imbues himself. It would exactly, exactly, and you know that sort of that sort of comic stuff with with you know Bumble putting all his faith in his in his hat and in his office as Beadle uh, does sort of uh, you know makes a more serious point about identity in this novel because that is how he defines himself. He has constructed his own identity, his own self as as a Beadle, and when he's when that is taken away from him, he has no identity. You know. Uh, the only identity he has is a henpecked husband who is relieved to be separated from his wife in the workhouse, you know. Um, 
and that, you know, Dickens finds, Dickens finds henpecked husbands hilarious. He loves the idea of men being sort of browbeaten by their wives, which raises all sorts of other issues uh, about gender, which we haven't really touched on. But we are nearing the end. And so one of the other things, well, there were two other things I put on the, on the handout. One was this idea about the, uh, the relationship between novels and newspapers and this question of whether there is anything sort of journalistic um, in this book. Um, we don't really have time to talk about that now, but I do think about that in terms of the politics of the book, the way in which Dickens is trying to make a sort of political and social point in this novel. Um, you know, he did start his career as a journalist, Dickens, you know, and so I think he, you know, he, is, he is used to incorporating this sort of um, uh, real-life political and social issues into his writing, and he continues to do that even within the novel form. So the other thing I asked uh, on the handout was um, for you to just to pick up one quotation from the novel that you thought best summed up the idea of selfhood or identity that gets put, uh, gets put forward uh, in this novel. And I was wondering if anybody wanted to share their quotation. No? <laughs> Don't all rush at once. Uh, Go on, Lawrence. Sorry, no, you're going to have to let me find it. Okay, all right. Someone else. Carly, what did you choose? I did have one, but we did kind of discuss it in terms of okay. Nancy being a construct of her environment. Okay, well... That was the one that really struck it with me when Rose was saying to her about, can I help you? And Nancy was saying, basically, you a woman like me, you're from a different world, basically. Right, yeah, yeah. So we did kind of discuss it, but it was basically a reflection of Nancy in general, really, and yeah. gender, and how... The role of women obviously can differ greatly in society based on where they're born and who. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good one. That, that sort of conversation between Rose and Nancy is fascinating for Dickens' ideas of gender and femininity, and the way in which Rose is this sort of ideal woman and Nancy is this uh, sort of corrupted woman who almost doesn't get to see Rose because, you know, the people downstairs recognise that she's a prostitute. But, you know, uh, and you know, Nancy recognises this and sort of accepts her fate, as you say, Carly. But the sort of the one gleam of, of, of redemption for Dickens in Nancy's character is that she has this sort of maternal feeling for Oliver. So on some level, she is still fulfilling her role as a woman, as Dickens sees it. Yeah, sort of just talk about that with, right at the beginning of chapter XL ten something. Um, forty. Yeah, forty. <laughs> It says, the girl's life had been squandered in the streets and among the most noisome of the stews and dens of London, but it was something of the woman's original nature left in yeah, her still. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. He has belief that, yeah, that inherently she is, she is a good husband, like, yeah. even though she's been corroded by the, the stews of London. Completely, completely. And it comes back to that nature-nurture thing, you know. Nancy's experience has corrupted her almost beyond redemption, but there is that sort of seed or spark of inherent goodness which sort of survives that. Anybody else with a different quotation that they got from the book? Fraser. Um, I changed on the earlier on the art of Okay. I think it's page 48 in my copy, which is easy um, Just a description, basically. Uh, the boy who addresses inquiry to the young wayfarer is about his own age, but one of the queerest looking boys that Oliver had ever seen. He was a stub nosed, flat browed, common faced boy enough, and as, a dirty, and as dirty a juvenile as one would wish to see. But he uh, had about him airs and a man's and a man. What do you think was interesting about that? Um, I think it's more about Oliver's kind of city and he's sort of been thrust upon by this boy and it's sort of a totally new kind of look for him. I don't know if you know what I mean, you've never seen someone quite like him yeah. with the confidence and like the age, the same age. Yeah. He's sort of quite confident, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And the Dodger seems to sum up this idea that you get a lot in this novel that your, sort of, your character is defined by how you act. And how you look, and so the Dodger's got this very unique look, and he sort of presents it. He's got, you know, he's meant to be a sort of a comic, but I suppose in some ways a disturbing character because he is a young boy. He's not much older than Oliver, but he's meant to act and look like an, a grown man, you know, or wear the clothes of a grown man in the manner of a grown man. And so there's that idea that he has sort of he has made himself this uh, this sort of quite strange and perhaps for Dickens unnatural identity, uh, which he's then sort of projecting onto the world, but you never really get an insight into what is going on inside his mind. Uh, we're going to have to stop there.
So thank you very much. That was a really interesting discussion. Um, and thank you to the presenters. Uh, so next week we are looking at Cranford, uh, the series of stories originally that Elizabeth Gaskell published in, in uh, All the Year Round, which was, um, no, sorry, Household Words, which was Dickens's uh, journal, Dickens's magazine that he published. Um, and Gaskell published the stories in this, in this magazine and then subsequently had them uh, bound together and published as a book. So I've got a, a handout again just for... Uh, yeah, um, to give you a few suggestions for things we're going to talk about next week. So I'll pass them around now.